Hey everyone, welcome on in to today's webinar. I see some familiar faces and some new ones here. So everyone who's joining, I'd love to get a sense of who's here, where you're joining from and your company. And so if you can in the chat, go ahead and enter in your name, your company and where you're joining us from. I think we actually might have some international participants today, which is pretty awesome. Well, I hope no one stayed up incredibly late. <laughs> Hopefully it's mostly Europe and not Japan. Oh uh, no, people have been like waiting all week for this. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Hey, Karen. See some good faces there. Sweet. So what we'll do is go ahead and get started and jump right in. So for today's conversation, I have the pleasure of talking with James Cole, founder of The Hub, which is an online platform to connect CPG brands to freelance photographers and videographers. So what we're going to do for the day is keep the conversation fairly um, informal and open. We want this to be as valuable to you as possible. So think of questions, anything that you have, um, ask. What we'll do is as questions come up throughout the entire conversation, go ahead and enter those into the chat and I'll ask those to, to James or um, I'm actually, depending on the question, ask for you to unmute yourself and just hop on and ask James the question directly. That way you can make sure to get any context out as well. And James is going to start by just giving a quick overview of the hub and all the awesome things that you can do with the platform. For my own brand, T-Squares, I've used the hub, I think three times now and ran projects through. So it's been extremely valuable and something that I stand behind and tell everyone about. And then at the end of the uh, webinar today, we're gonna to actually do a giveaway for a free photo shoot to the hub up to $1,000. So that's gonna to go to whoever asks the best question um, or ask a question, we'll say, and then we'll randomly select someone who's asked a question throughout the, the conversation today. And then just for attending, everyone will actually receive 10% off the hub on the photo shoot, which is awesome. So you can jump right in and get that set up. And then for Food Bevy members as well, we're going to be um, auctioning or raffling off um, three 50% off discounts to the hub. So lots of ways to save money because as James will kind of say and tell you, he's really all about helping to create a great ecosystem for CPG brands and help the photographers on the platform. And so this is all about you and getting the most out of it. So with that, James, I'd love for you to give a quick intro and share a little bit more about the hub. Cool. Thanks. Um, so good to talk to all of you guys. I don't do many of these sort of large Zoom. So I'm going to try to keep this as interesting and relevant as possible. I was speaking to Jordan and I said, instead of sort of preparing something uh, a bit formal or stilted and putting together 30 slides, either some of which would be really obvious or some of which would be over people's heads. I figured I'd just sort of meet you guys where you are. I'm assuming many of you are founders of sort of small food and beverage companies, although some of you might be uh, founders of larger companies. Um, and as such, people have very varying degrees of understandings and, and familiarity with what we do. So I'd love to just give a little rundown of what we do and then ask, have you guys asked questions? Um, anything related to content creation? I've been in this space for five years. So whether it's the price of content or the process by which you create it or where you should be using it or, you know, my thoughts on Instagram versus TikTok or really anything, I'm happy to, to sort of jump in and, and help. Um, so yeah, as Jordan said, I started the hub, uh, five years ago, I'm just going to share my screen. So you guys have some, some reference. Um, these are some shoots that we've just done in the past couple of weeks for a lot of your peers. Um, these are all people that are members of, um, indie brand, uh, CPG. A lot of these people are in CPP. Some of them might be in food bevy, um, so this is all work for Ourobora, Julie's, Rise, Health Aid Kombucha, Alapop, Jot, et cetera. So a lot of brands that I'm sure you guys are familiar with or would consider peers or, or um, competitors or something to that effect. And again, this is just all stuff that's sort of tumbled out of our platform in the past couple of weeks. We do hundreds and hundreds of shoots every month for brands like you guys. And this is you know what comes out the other side. 
So I thought I'd just sort of show that. Um, my favorite thing to do is work with larger brands on many, many, many shoots simultaneously. So we just did work for Pop-Tarts actually um, as, a, as a part of a much larger thing that we did for Kellogg's. We did 150 shoots for Kellogg's in three weeks. And so I had 90 different photographers all across the country, all shooting things for Ego, Pop-Tarts, RX Bar, you name it. There are, I think, over 1,200 photos in this folder um, for all of these different brands that you see here. Um, so that's like the output. And then in terms of how the hub works, for those of you who haven't used it, it's super easy. It's like Airbnb or any other sort of marketplace you've used. You uh, create an account, it's free to create an account. You sign up as a brand. Um, we'll see if this logs me in. This is my photographer account. So one second, I'll just switch over. Come on. So after you've created an account, it will look something like this. You can post your first job by clicking post a job or after you've posted several jobs, it will just give you the option to post another job. It takes you through a very, very intuitive flow. Are you looking for a photographer or videographer? We also have lots of, of GIF makers. Sometimes they're photographers that are pretty good at motion. Sometimes they're videographers that are also good at stills. So you can really pick either for GIFs. You indicate what you're looking for. So for you guys, it's probably food photography or studio or lifestyle photography. You put in a title. So, um, you know, product shots on red paper for new skew of kombucha. Then you put in a description of the job. So you describe in as much detail as possible, you know, these are the kinds of product shots that you want. It would be great if you included pomegranates because that's one of the ingredients in this particular skew. Um, please don't include any hands, make sure that the shadows aren't too harsh and so on and so forth. So you would just put a long description there. If you have some sort of document, whether it's a, a PDF or a PowerPoint or something, you can also upload that. You can pick whether you want people immediately near you. Some clients are old fashioned and still like to go to the shoot or get to know the photographer, fine. We have people in every major city all across the United States. Uh, or you can click the remote option, which I highly recommend if you have a shippable product. You just ship your nut butter or granola or uh, kombucha across the country to whoever you pick. And often you can find people way below market value because they live in a suburb of Minneapolis and not in Los Angeles or New York City. So I like re recommending that option. It takes about 10 to 14 days for a photo shoot to be completed. So we recommend, you know, two weeks at least. And then, you know, the cost is very affordable for those of you who've worked with agencies. It's very, very affordable for those of you who are still working with a friend uh, from high school who's decent at photography or your cousin or an influencer or something like that. It's more or less what you've been paying maybe a little bit more for much better quality. Our best people are in the sort of 800 to $1,500 range, I'd say. Um, so I recommend that budget if you can afford it. If not, we have plenty of good people in a much lower range. And then you post your job. Um, there are a couple optional fields like uh, usage rights. If you want to be able to use it in print advertisement or on a billboard or something, you have to specify that. Um, there's an opportunity to upload a mood board, which we highly recommend and so on. And then all of these jobs appear on a very, very lengthy job board. Again, there are hundreds and hundreds of jobs and 40,000 photographers from across the country will bid on the job. So, you know, this job here, I got 10 bids on that I posted on behalf of one of our larger clients, Kashi. And I can look at the bids that I've received and the recent work they've done that might be relevant, communicate with relevant creators and so on. So all of this is free, guys. There's no cost at all. You don't put a credit card in until you sign a contract with a creator. The only added or hidden, hidden cost is a 3.5% credit card processing fee, almost all of which goes to the credit card companies. Um, otherwise, if you do a thousand dollar shoot, what you see is what you get. It costs you a grand plus that little fee. The 
uh, payment to my platform comes from the creator side. So our hope is that it's a useful tool and it adds absolutely no cost. If anything, again, it just saves you a lot of time and money because we've pre-vetted all of these awesome creators from all across the country. So that's how the hub works. And again, I showed you what it creates, which are you know these beautiful images by the hundreds, by the thousands sometimes. Um, and again, we're the content engine for, you know, brands as big as pop tarts and pringles and nutrigrain and whatever and brands as small as you guys are even smaller i would imagine um so for for people of your size it might be three shoots a year that you do on the hub whereas for a kellogg's brand it might be three shoots a day or certainly three shoots a week and we can play in that whole spectrum so i'm going to pause there and just sort of let questions accumulate um again i i'm pretty deep in this world of content. Uh, we were sort of doing a bit of influencer marketing in our early days, which I was very quick to sort of reject. Um, but I, I know more about influencer marketing and content than your average bear. And so I'm happy to sort of be an ally to you guys as to, again, whether it comes to pricing, advice on briefing in your first photographer, where content matters and where it doesn't, where you should be spending money against content any number of questions like that, I'm, I'm happy to, to do my best and try to answer. Appreciate that overview, James. I think it was very um, descriptive, like what the, the hub has to offer. And what I love most as well is when you put out bids for projects, you can see exactly the style each photographer has and can use those as examples and referencing saying, hey, I want something like this. Yeah, also kind we, have, of, we have photographers that are food photographers of every flavor, whether it's recipe or lifestyle or whatever, but we also have done a lot of fashion work in the past, lifestyle work. So, you know, their product shots, we, we like to think ours are more inventive and interesting, like this flowers made out of milk, which was our client Clover, um, obviously, and sort of fun little gifs and motion stuff. Um, but yeah, if you go to our website and click our work, you can see, you know, over a hundred case studies of almost every flavor. Um, all kinds of different things and different styles. That's awesome. So that kind of leads into a question that Alvaro has. So I'm actually going to invite him up to to ask that. Okay. Hi, James. Hi. Um, so I had a question I sent in in the chat, but um, so a lot of the the brands that you work with, like Arabora and Olipop, I've seen a lot of their shots on Behance. So it's awesome to see that you were the one that actually did them, but. Um, a lot of them have similar feels, which is something that we want to go after because it's clearly really effective in like translating simplicity and authenticity, but also just excitingness with those pastel box shelf kind of shots. Um, and they're awesome, but how can a new brand stand out while still fitting into this trend that does after all really work to convey those themes that I had mentioned? Uh, I think there are two ways to answer that question. One is an editorial answer, which is to say it's your choice. Uh, you're the founder of your company and how your brand looks and feels and comes off is sort of up to you. You, you can try to conform or you can try to be quite different. And it's just really a, an aesthetic personal brand choice, just like you came up with your logo and your label and so on. And then there's the sort of data led choice, which is to say, let's say you're running Facebook ads, as I'm sure many of you are after COVID. Um, you know, let the data speak, right? You can shoot this sort of tried and true product box shot, blah, 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 and see how that converts on a, on a per click or per acquisition basis, and then try some other stuff um, and let the data sort of guide you. Uh, same thing with like conversion percentage on your website or click through rates on an email that you send out, right? Like I'll be the first to admit that beautiful content, though nice, doesn't keep the lights on. So it needs to be content that is compelling people in some sort of measurable way. And so it's really your choice whether you let the data guide that aesthetic thinking or if you're going to let your aesthetic sensibility guide it. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because everyone wants kind of really great, beautiful shots that shows off your product. But you know, if you're posting something new every day to Instagram and you need at least seven pieces of content a week and want it all different, you're going to be putting out a lot of kind of high quality content, which if you're doing every day can kind of add up and write like how much value do you get per piece is kind of up in the air. I think one thing that's taken off recently is more UGC or user generated content and even 
a little bit of like stage user generate content, right? Where you might work with a photographer, videographer to create kind of these these pieces that look like an unboxing video or someone enjoying your product. Have you seen the rise of those types of content on the platform, James? Um, surprisingly not. I think I think we are sort of viewed as more of, of the former that the gentleman was just asking about, the sort of like tried and true, really solid, aspirational, very tightly executed product shot that's still remarkably cheap for what it is. Um, definitely with clients where I have more of a engaged relationship. So some people just use my software. I've never spoken to them. Some people use it a lot and I have a relationship with them. And then some people we function as more of an agency where I really, I'm actually an investor in Ourobora, for example, and he's on my board. And you know there are lots of brands like that that we really intertwine with. Um, I've done everything from run Facebook ads to uh, help with the SEO strategy to email nurture sequencing, what have you for, for our clients. So the clients that use us most heavily, yes, Jordan, like we will at some point have a conversation about UGC, about these sort of more homespun videos and the hub can be used for that. And so far as instead of paying someone 1200 bucks for the aforementioned polished shoot, they can pay 300 bucks to four people to all film on their iPhones or shitty little digital cameras and create sort of more homespun, perhaps even a series, right? Like our product is always shown in the following way or with the color yellow or, um, so I, I like those campaigns because you get many voices and many sort of different iterations of creativity out in the world expressing your brand. Awesome, that makes sense. All right, so Camille has a question around Pinterest. So Camille, I just asked you to unmute if you can ask your question. Yes. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, pleasure meeting you. Um, my question is, you know, people are trying to find alternate channels that are in Facebook and Instagram. Um, and I've just been hearing a lot about Pinterest um, as a potential channel um, to spend on, but I've been hearing a lot of mixed reviews. Some are saying that, you know, the cost per clicks are really low and that it's generating a lot of traffic and sales. And other people are saying, don't even waste a dollar of your budget on it. And so um, given that, you know, there's just such a visual um, focus uh, to Pinterest, uh, I'd love to know uh, what uh, your experiences are, if you've seen anything successful or not with your clients and uh, kind of where you stand in terms of recommending uh, that channel to us. I'm definitely not a Pinterest expert. I, I would agree that it makes sense to sort of go away from the, where the masses are. I think that there's a really important distinction that we should make. There's owned social media and then there's paid social media. Owned is your, you know, your brand's Instagram that you own. Right now, about 8% of your followers see your photos. So if you have a thousand followers, 80 of them will see it at all. And the other 920 will never see the content. So, you know, my corporate Instagram, I grew to a hundred thousand followers in five months. This was four years ago, organically, no, no creepy shit and was able to real. I mean, I built a brand on the back of Instagram truly. And now most of my clients that spend a lot of time toiling over trying to get to 10 K or what have you, owned Instagram, owned Facebook, ain't what it used to be and will almost certainly not be worth any investment of your time as the founder or your money. Um, owned Pinterest, on the other hand, owned LinkedIn, these organic channels are much better, right? The, the They're just sort of less. Mark Zuckerberg has made a decision to basically force you to pay for advertising on his platform now, whereas these other platforms are greener pastures. So I'd say in an owned capacity, Pinterest is way smarter than spending your time on Instagram. In terms of a paid capacity, Instagram and Facebook are still, I think, among the best, if not the best, just in terms of their targeting mechanisms and how sophisticated the ad platform is. So if you're going to pay for it and you have someone that knows what they're doing, I think Instagram and, and Facebook can't be beat really from a paid perspective, unless you're one of these brands you alluded to that one channel works really well for them. I've had clients where LinkedIn kills, Pinterest kills, one client's even using Bing right now, which I haven't heard of since the, you know, <laughs> the early 2000s. So long way of saying, go where others aren't in an organic owned capacity. And then if you're going to spend money, I think Facebook and Instagram is still the best, perhaps Google, but one of those two or three. Um, 
try out Pinterest, try out anything. But once you've done the experiment, if it's not there, it's not there. Great. Thank you so much. Awesome. So Karam, I'd like to invite you up to ask your question on copywriting and image. Hello. How are What's you? Up, We've spoken before, I think, right? Um, New York, possibly. I think so. Yeah. Uh, my question is, what are your thoughts on, I guess, maybe in image copywriting or copy to uh, push for more engagement since engagement is going to be one of our success metrics on social platforms, not just follows? Yeah. Like, yeah. So a couple of things there. I mean, uh, like when I first started this, it was all about how many followers you had. And then people got wise to the fact that you could have a very disengaged following, which is of no use to you in a sales capacity. And it also looks kind of sketchy. It looks like you bought your followers. So engagement's important. But I think even beyond that, again, I would just repeat to all of you guys, and this is somewhat antithetical to like what someone like me should say. So this should really stick with you. You know, spending time on Instagram, spending time on Facebook, trying to grow that following, trying to grow that organic follower count or engagement rate. I don't think it will be ROI positive in terms of your time spent versus products sold. Um, so it's just something to think about. I think it's a, a good thing to have, have your 5,000 followers and post every so often and so on. It's a good you, it's table stakes in 2021, but it's no longer a sales engine. Um, as to your question about copywriting, yeah, a hack in the beginning, if you're short on cash, there's a website that everyone should write down called Unsplash. Um, many of you I'm sure have heard of it. They've erupted over the past five years. It's all what's called creative commons. It's really good photography. So you can type in coffee or you can type in whatever concept you're running ads against or posting about and there's really quality photography. It's not branded, obviously, but um, if you wanted to run Facebook ads about dehydration or exhaustion or something like that, you can type in exhaustion or dehydration into Unsplash and get thousands of images back, all of which are downloadable on high res and you own full rights to as they are Creative Commons. In terms of like posting memes, if that's what you meant, or like reappropriating, you know, like a scene from a movie or something, there's so much of that happening. No one's going to come after you. I think it's worth the risk. It's a risk, but it's a very small one. So I think that's fine. In terms of like stealing the work of a young creator, you have to be careful. You know, cancel culture is very real. We as a company have dealt several times with people going rogue who have 60,000 followers and not realizing how big that mouthpiece is. So I wouldn't recommend like, fucking with copyright law with a kid with a loaded gun in the form of 60,000 listeners. Um, they're not going to take legal action, which is usually people's concern, but they can badmouth you in a pretty widespread way. And photographers tend to kind of band together and they'll reshare things like this. And I've seen brands get black eyes from, from that. So yes to memes and movies and like things like that, those big players won't come after you no to individual creators and like not giving them credit. James, what about the effectiveness of overlaying text on top of an image versus just letting the image speak for itself? I think, you know, you have to be really careful. One has to be careful answering questions like that because whatever I say won't be the case every time. Um, and you should just test, right? Like that's the, that's the benefit of a direct to consumer sort of e-com channel. That's the benefit of Facebook ads. So all of you, I'm sure pre COVID on average, you're doing 70, 80, 90% of sales through more traditional retail channels. And I'd venture all of you are going 10, 15, 20, 30% e-com if you weren't above that already. It's so testable, it's so dynamic. And so I would try putting to your question, Jordan, try putting the text on the image and try putting it not and running 200 bucks against each and just seeing what works and what doesn't. Facebook has uh, rules in place about not taking up more than 20% of the frame with text and things like that. So that's an easy answer. But otherwise, I would just say, you could have asked me anything, Jordan, whether it's about text or blonde models versus brunette ones or recipe shots that show the ingredients versus it, it, it's different for every brand. And so just A-B test, A-B test. Don't spend money unless you're learning something, but be comfortable wasting money learning something. That drives into another question because I think all of us theoretically know we should be A-B testing. It might do like one or two tests, but then like 
since we're you know small teams obviously that our direction gets pulled in, in some other way so or our attention gets pulled in some other direction do you have any like methodology for maintaining a b tests or do you kind of go down and like all right here's an image test for two weeks or any way to help brands kind of structure that over time yeah it's hard i mean i think the the key is just having a clear matrix of what you're going to be testing and in what order and you can put that in a google sheet or any sort of rudimentary you don't need any fancy software or whatever but just sort of what variable am i isolating I think you should always be asking yourself as a small business owner, like before you spend above $500 at all, let alone on ads like this, the question should be, what am I going to learn from this? You know, if it works, what did I learn? And if it doesn't work, what did I learn? Is there a clear hypothesis that can either be affirmed or rejected? Um, if you don't have a question that you are like, if you don't have a thesis or a hypothesis, that you're going into a test with, then you're not going to learn anything. And then it's a waste of money definitionally. So just make a matrix of all the things you want to test. I think funny copy will do well. I think copy with emojis will do well. I think images of blonde models will do well. I think images of our product alone will do well. These are all hypotheses. And then you can test them and isolate those variables systematically. Makes sense. Yvonne has a question. And he asks, does the hub do any analytics on images sourced through the site to see what the trends are? Uh, I wish is the answer. My One of my best friends from college works for the NSA, actually, and he was visiting me recently and going through our data. We do have data. We are gathering data. We don't really surface it to users, nor have we done any white papers or anything. We're a very small company, which usually surprises people because software has a, a bad habit of seeming big and important, even though it can just be one person behind a screen. Um, and we just don't have the, the bandwidth or the, the, the sort of EBITDA lying around to, to spend on a fancy data analyst or a developer to build that out. But one day, I think it would be cool. Awesome. Hassan, I'll ask you to uh, jump on and unmute yourself to ask your question. Hello? Can you hear me? You're good. Perfect. Um, sorry. Um, my question revolves around sort of getting the agencies out of the way and how can we build a relationship or should we build a relationship with cheaper end of the uh, photographers um, and get product in use because that's what we feel we are missing and that's what we feel that we get engagement the most on IG but after what you said about like posting photos and what it does to sales I'm not sure but um, I was particularly interested in that building that process um, much like the example of lesser evil on the platform uh, what would you recommend on uh, going about building a process that provides results month in month out? Yeah. Uh, so I guess there were a couple of questions there. One was sort of about removing an agency. Like, listen, I, I worked I worked at a big ad agency in New York. I tend to think sort of very little of agencies. The problem tends to be that they have a lot of overhead. COVID's changing this, but they have an office. They have a lot of employees that may or may not be staffed on your project. So they have to charge you a lot more for any given thing, whether it's running your Facebook ads or helping you with SEO or creating content for you. So you're paying a premium. And then most of you as quite small brands, you're like pretty low on their list of priorities. And so you get more junior people. So it's the worst of both worlds. I'm a big fan of the future of work, the decentralization of the workforce. And it's why I've done what I've done with photography. Uh, but you know, I have a network personally of 20 or 30 people that serve all the functions that you might need to build an e-com stack. So whether that's email nurture sequencing expert or an SEO expert or at, you know, AdWords expert or Facebook ad expert, whatever. Um, so I'm happy to just as a favor to this community, if anyone needs someone or people like that, I can plug you in you can kind of build your own agency. If you fancy yourself to be somewhat fluent in what's happening, you can manage those people or have someone internally on your team manage them. So I can help you build an agency is the long and short of it. And I think going directly to the designer or to the developer or to the photographer in my case is almost always better. Um, to your second question about um, setting up a process. Yeah. I mean, lesser evil is interesting. They're, they're much bigger than I think most of you. And 
and yet I worked directly with them. There was no agency involved on that on on that series of projects. They also, unlike most brands of their size, actually use my platform instead of using me to use my platform. Some people pay me ten grand a month, and I go and do the shoots. Um, Lesser Evil, we did that a bit in the beginning, but now they just post shoots on their own and, and like using the the software. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know that I have a concise answer of how to build that process. Uh, with, in the case of photography, I, I do think my platform does a pretty damn job. I wouldn't, I wouldn't still be doing it if I didn't think that was the case. I think you can use it quite easily without the help of anyone, myself included. Um, if you're going to do it outside of my platform, find a place to go fishing, like it's like Instagram, and just you know look around hashtags. DM people that you think are compelling or would do a good job. Sign a one or two or three shoot pilot with them just to test each other out. Limit your exposure, hold them accountable for doing a good job. And if they do a good job, extend it into a longer relationship at a lower price point. That's what I would say. Awesome. Thank you for that. So then uh, next I'll ask James uh, Raina from Jibby Coffee to hop on and ask your question. Hey guys, uh, James Jordan, thanks for hosting. Uh, my question is just around best practices for shoots. Um, like what are some of the keys to a successful shoot, especially in uh, a remote setting where you're not around for creative freedom or creative direction? Um, and like how does creative freedom come into play for the photographer when you're trying to get something that fits your brand, but also something that's you know, new and fresh? Yeah. I think that's a that's a decision you have to make as a founder is do you want what's called matching luggage like do you want to have brand guidelines and have all your photo shoots adhere to those guidelines to the letter or do you like the fact that you bring in creative people and they sort of riff on some sort of centralized approach but you can actually see what different people trying it on in their style will look like and it's really your choice as to where you fall Historically, brands were built very much of matching luggage and in e -com, you can be running very different ads at the same time, right? And the same two people won't see it necessarily. So you can be different brands to different people. Yeah. Um, in terms of, I, you know, I think communication as with any relationship is very important. I think visual communication with visual people, making a mood board, you know, here are 10 images that I love. Here are my three favorite you know, photos that we've ever taken of our brand or of our competitor or of another brand that I really admire. Can you, can you uh, sort of mimic this aesthetic? Maybe as a call and response, have them send you back work they've done recently that was in that style, or at the very least, have them make a mood board to counter your mood board to make sure that they've internalized the vibe and aesthetic, right? So as with anything, I think it's just expressing yourself well. I would argue visually is probably the best way with these people. And then having them repeat what you just said to the point that you see examples of their past work or at least a mood board and you're like, yeah, that's, that is what I'm looking for. And then the only variable left is do they execute well? And if they have a lot of examples of thoughtful work on their, on their platform, the answer is probably yes. With the one exception, James, which is my last bit of advice is like, don't try to like, when you get close enough to anything, you can split hairs and see nuance. A photographer is not a photographer is not a photographer. Some photographers are versatile, but most of these young photographers that you find on Instagram or on my platform have gotten really good at, at a style or an aesthetic. And so if they're already shooting quite similarly to what you want, you're probably in business. I wouldn't hire someone that shoots in an entirely different style and assume they can make that leap. And I also wouldn't try to do four different shoots, a lifestyle shoot, a product shoot, and so on with the same photographer. Just because they're really good at product photography doesn't mean they're good at lifestyle photography. So I'd recommend finding different people for different aesthetics. Great, thank you. Awesome. And so we had a couple questions around TikTok. So let's talk about that. James, what has been your experience, if any, so far with, with TikTok and any advice on developing video for it? Um, 
I think a couple of things, I, I think more so than most platforms and maybe just a function of the times, there's a great book that I highly recommend the audio book of called Post COVID or Post Corona. Uh, it's by Scott Galloway. He's a professor at NYU Business School. Um, and he just talks about a ton of marketing trends, business trends, it's quite interesting. And what he talks about is that we have officially ended what's called the brand age and entered the product age. That is to say, we used to tell stories like the Marlboro Man to sell cigarettes or the cold Rockies to sell light beer. And it was about the, the whimsicality of the story. And it was all about sort of brand storytelling and the product just sort of lived underneath that fantasy. But now your product, because people are tweeting about it and talking about it and writing reviews and so on, you can't hide. Your product is sort of the truth. It is your brand, not so much the brand leading the product. I think um, as such, like TikTok in that it's newer, there's less, there's less overt sort of brand salesmanship than there is on Instagram. Um, I think it's like, it's where the kids are. So brands try to be a little bit, meet them where they are a bit more. Whereas Instagram's a little bit more overt in its, you know, in its a brand brandishing itself as a brand. So I think where possible, my advice on TikTok would be to try to meet the kids where they are, try to sort of become part of the cool world and let that inform your creative and not sort of thrust your brand down their throat. Sort of like the, the dad showing up at the high school party, it just feels kind of off. Um, yeah, and then I'd say what I said before, which is like the organic growth on TikTok will be much steeper than organic growth on Instagram. Growing in Instagram right now is so hard and so painstakingly slow and so not worth it insofar as only 8% of people that follow you will even see your content. So I would spend time on organic TikTok, definitely. Yeah, it's interesting. I think we're, TikTok is one of those platforms where if you are not a natural at it yourself, like if you look at TikTok and you're like, I have no freaking idea what's going on, it's better to go and find someone who like is natively using TikTok already, whether they're like an up and coming influencer or a group of them to really test out like who you can partner with. Because, you know, if, if you're developing content, right, like you might do a couple videos and then if it doesn't fit with your personality, you're going to stop anyway. Or if you hire and create like professional content, TikTok's are really all about, right? Like lots and lots of content almost every day. It's kind of like a Twitter for video. And so if it's not just there and authentic, then either you're going to tire of it before it becomes successful or it's not going to match up with what's on the platform. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I do that for my brand. I have, you know, a 17 year old right now running some of our socials. I think the age of like hiring a like social media manager for $60,000, like I would just recommend, as Jordan said, finding someone who's somewhat fluent in native in sort of natural to the given platform and letting them experiment a bit, not being so precious about your brand. Something I always find interesting is that founders are so protective of their socials because they view it as the, the lightning rod for all interest in their brand. And if they're not articulating themselves perfectly always, that it's going to somehow harm them. Fair enough. But I think if you can not inhibit yourself or create an artificial ceiling on how much that you can output and create an experiment and view some of these platforms as a dialogue, you put stuff out, you see what comes back, you evolve, and not so much a monologue. And as a function of that, having a ghostwriter, having a young kid that can just try things and play, once something starts hitting, then you can focus on it. But having a founder spend two hours of her day on social platforms when half of them aren't working seems like a waste. Yeah, I think that goes into another question. I know, you know, you work primarily in the content, but you have lots of experience with brands too. Like how much would you recommend founders invest in social and their presence there, especially when for a lot of brands, social doesn't directly drive sales anymore? Yeah, I mean, again, I, I think... Um, I think paid social, paid Facebook, Instagram, and Google are where it's at. I think owned and organic social is like a, it is a box to tick. Like it's expected that you have an Instagram as a brand, just like it was expected five years ago that you have a website or 10 years ago, even though 10 years ago, that wouldn't have been your biggest channel, not by a mile. Now it could well be. Um, 
So Instagram, having a Facebook, having a TikTok, these are things that you should have. There's things that you should update fairly consistently. It's something that you can have a young person chipping away at. And if you start to hit pay dirt or really see interest around something, maybe pay some of, of your attention, pay some of your money. But otherwise, Jordan, I would just say it's table stakes and to spend as little time as possible on it and spend more time on you know, customer acquisition, conversation with customers. I think there are better ways to speak to more people, ironically, than Instagram these days. Yeah, I mean, one platform that I've actually seen a lot more engagement on recently is LinkedIn. And yeah. actually, like more social converse, like conversations happening on LinkedIn, sometimes around content, sometimes around just, just like these semi-thought leadership pieces out there. Have you done or seen or have any thoughts on like LinkedIn or how to best use that as a platform? Yes. I actually haven't run any LinkedIn campaigns for clients, but I do know just from my travels in this space and through talking to other people that LinkedIn is white hot and sort of it's, it's very virgin snow for building an organic following, right? Like your organic reach on LinkedIn is substantially better than Instagram. Um, so Gary Vaynerchuk, who some of you love and some of you hate and some of you've never heard of, um, says document, don't create, you know, get in the habit of like outputting, 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 and not being so concerned with the curation of what you're saying and how you're saying it. Um, so the way I've hacked this for my brand is I do conversations like this with a writer. Her name is Ella and I do it every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for 85 bucks a session. I record it. Then I send it to someone who works for me, one of my most junior employees they chop it up. And if you look at my personal Instagram, LinkedIn and whatever, I post once or twice a day across Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, all stuff like this. Just Ella asking me questions like you're asking me answering, hopefully somewhat concisely or better than I am now. And then that is pushed out daily on all of these different channels. And that's how I, I as the founder of the company spend an hour and a half a week on it and relatively little money, but in posting daily and part of a lot of conversations that I'm actually not privy to. It's other people. I love that. Awesome. So just as a reminder too, we got about 15 minutes left. Any other questions that have come up on this conversation or any things you've been dying to ask, feel free to drop those in the chat or just say, Hey, I have a question. We'll get to that. Uh, next I'll go to Ashley. Um, Ashley, I'll ask you to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Hi, James. How are you? Great. How are you, Ashley? Doing well. Thank you so much for being here. I've actually worked with the Hub on, uh, on one video so far, and it was great. So I'm excited to chat more. So my question just speaks to the trends. So like things that brands are bringing to you, like the Ouroboros and the Olipops and, you know, what are they asking more for static shots, you know, stop motion, animated GIFs? Like, are you seeing anything more than the other? Or is it really like this full portfolio of, of digital assets that they can use across all channels? Just trying to, you know, as a solopreneur, trying to figure out where to, you know, spend my time strategically. And, you know, the com this conversation is super helpful since I am a person that does spend a lot of time on social. Um, so just figuring out how to optimize my time best at this time. Yeah, uh, I'll answer the second part of the question first because I think there are two of them there. The second part would be um, where are your sales, like the question as to where you should spend your time, like where are your sales coming from? Like, do you have a really good email following? And every time you send out a newsletter, like you get 22 sales. Is it Facebook ads? Is it, um, you, know, what, 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 you know, where is it coming from? Is there content in that channel or in that avenue? And how can you try optimizing that content and seeing if it makes a difference in what the lift is and trying to justify that delta, right? If you're spending a grand on Facebook a month versus 10 grand, the spending a thousand dollars on the content will be justified or not right based on how many sales are yielded so i would look at where your sales are coming from i would spend time in those arenas and wherever there is content in that channel uh try to op optimize it as to like how other brands are optimizing um gifs are very pos uh, popular like motion of, of all kinds um short little videos and gifs we're seeing much more of um, 
to the gentleman's question earlier, the sort of classic product shot, you know, my, my favorite is just like on seamless, meaning a, a solid color, right? With some sort of inventive flourish that showcases your brand. And it's not just the product on a colored block or something like that, that could be any product, but that there's something like that flower I showed earlier, if you were on for that, yeah. um, that like feels distinctive and like that image couldn't be swapped out with a Coca-Cola bottle and that would play. Um, so I think inventive product photography that's somewhat visually arresting GIFs and videos are what we see most. Cool, that's super helpful. Awesome, cool. thank you. So Thank next, uh, Rosaria, I'll ask you to hop on and ask your question. Hi, I'm sorry I don't have my video, but uh, thank you anyway for being here, James. Thank you. My, my question is about um, LinkedIn, and it's more of an opinion, I think, that I'm asking for. Um, there is a, a confessional style that seems to have replaced the paid advertisement or just uh, product branding on LinkedIn. And I find it in the, among CPG founders, everybody's talking about uh, failures and their daily struggles. And it becomes, I don't know, having been on LinkedIn forever, I find it very unusual and sometimes even annoying. But is it a trend uh, towards uh, having uh, the founder center stage more than the product? Or is it just, uh, you know, a phase like many other phase? I mean, should I jump into it? That's probably my question. <laughs> or I should just wait until it, uh, it becomes less. I think probably based on how you're asking the question, I'd say you shouldn't jump into it, right? It feels like something that would be rather out of character to you. Maybe even part of you has this taste for it. And with any of these things, it's, it's all lead bullets, no silver bullets, right? Like, unfortunately, you see these other brands and it feels like they've grown this, like the Tenza T guy or whatever, I see him all the time or that have built these things and they feel like they've come out of nowhere, but that takes a lot of time if you do it yourself. Or in a lot of cases, these guys or gals are paying, I know one in particular that I hate, this slimy agency that does a lot of LinkedIn automation and they're actually, the founders aren't writing it. It's someone else behind the curtain. Um, so anyway, it takes a lot of money if you're going to pay someone else to do it or a lot of dedication and time if it's going to be you. And I think if you have distaste for it already, it's just going to wear on you and become less and less authentic, less and less palatable and exciting to others. And it's just going to wear on you. So I would say, don't do it, right? Like, how do you like to talk about your brand? Like what channels come naturally to you? Where do you want to be having a dialogue? How do you want to be connecting with other brands or followers or customers and spend your time having those conversations in those places? I think if the sort of self-promotion, false modesty, failure story, LinkedIn bullshit is like tiresome to you as it sounds like it is, I would just skip it. So may I say that you also get annoyed by it every once in a while <laughs> or is it just me? It, get a what? Oh yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 um, it is, um, sort of predatory, right? It's like using, it's like, it's like false vulnerability or false modesty or, or it's solicitous. It feels very salesy. So yeah, I, 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 you know what? I don't do it for clients, so I don't know how well it works. It must work decently because enough people do it, but, um, yeah, I think most people probably have the reaction you do. Right. And your, the lifeblood of all of your businesses is, are your, what I call your weird customers, the customers that don't just come once or twice or three times a year, but come like four times a month. And you're kind of confused as to why they're so obsessed with your product and like building a very genuine relationship with them, either personally or through your brand and your story and your authenticity. And so if you're attracting the wrong people by acting in an inauthentic way, either to your brand or yourself, I think in the long run, maybe it creates bubbles on the top it's sort of exciting and you get some sales and some attention you get some validation you're hungry for because you've been in the entrepreneurial trenches but in terms of building a long sustainable business for many of you this is such a lifestyle i mean i've met so many food and beverage founders right like you're making it in your kitchen or you're driving and sleeping in the fulfillment center or 
your husband or wife is, you know, working two jobs and helping and it's so real and so raw and so honest and so close. So I just recommend being yourself and trying to be as authentic as possible personally and as a brand. And if you get too far from that, it, it, um, you crack at some point and it shows. Yeah. I think that's something that I second is definitely be yourself and what comes naturally, because if you're doing something that doesn't feel genuine and authentic, you're going to tire of it so fast and hate what you're doing, (laughs) whether that comes from like content or what you're posting or, or whatnot, like just be you and the right people will come to you. It's going to take some time, you know, for that to happen, but I think that that's the best way forward. And then James, something a little bit more tactical, going back to kind of creative direction for a project. When creating a kind of creative brief or or for video or video, or photograph or video, um, what do you recommend putting in there to make that direction really clear so that you get out of it what you're expecting? As I said before, I think like visual references are very helpful. Like if it looked like this, I'd be thrilled, you know, or these five images that have put in a blender instead of what I'm looking for for the shoot. That's just very clear and harder to mistake than vague language. Um, I think if there are any do's and don'ts is a section of our brief that I showed you guys before, it's an optional section. But if there are any like non-negotiables, like I hate harsh light or please, you know, make sure to have our label facing this direction or something like those non-negotiables are important as well. But I think visually it's probably the best way to express yourself, have examples of work that would make you happy and have them try to emulate that. And as I noted earlier, better if they've emulated it many times prior than saying, yeah, yeah, I can do it, no problem. Because some photographers can't adapt their style as easily as you might hope. James, what direction are you giving any of your clients on content development for 2021? Anything that you're, you're changing or adapting to? I think I've always tried to be pretty practical as to how they're using the content and if it's worth it. So again, I'm repeating myself here, but Instagram organic just isn't what it used to be. And, you know, a lot of brands, a lot of founders, you hear things like I need to be posting every day and we make these ridiculous rules and then you need to create content or at least have thought about what you're posting. And I think it's a waste of time. And I think it's a waste of my platform. If you're going to spend money on my platform, I want to make sure it's going to a place where it's going to make you money and you'll have a positive association with the work you've done with us. So advice I give is like, what is this for? And do you need it? Is this the difference between success and failure? Will you see an alpha in sales if you have better content here? Is this like central to your brand and how you want to discuss it and therefore worth paying the money for? And if the answer is no, I'll steer steer people away um, from doing it in the first place. I think there's also like a line on my platform. It's maybe $900 to $1,000 at this point, where if you spend under it, it's quite a steep drop off. If you spend over it, it's diminishing returns. So if you use the hub, you should know that right now it's $900 to 1000 bucks. If you're not using my platform, this can be for content or anything, I suppose. But like, you know, where, where's the break? Like where, where does, like you, you get what you pay for up to a point. And where is that line and how can you save up? So I often get to tell clients, listen, it's in my best interest if you use me five times a month, but maybe it makes sense to save up and just do two shoots a month that are twice as much um, because our, you, you know, then you cross our line. Um, so fewer shoots, better shoots, know where the line is and don't use us at all. Don't make content at all, at all unless it's central to your brand or moving the needle on sales. Awesome. I no, that. I don't then, mean, I don't mean per photo. I mean, per shoot and how many photos are in a shoot totally depends on the shoot. So a very, very involved flat lay thing where your product is in the middle and there's 17 ingredients and it takes an hour and a half to set up. You might get five images from a thousand dollar shoot. If it's a lifestyle shoot with models eating your product on the go in New York city, maybe you get 37. So it sort of depends. Um, but we, we think the value is quite extraordinary, you know, paying a thousand dollars and getting a, a substantive body of work for whatever the purpose is, right? Enough that you have many images that you really love from the shoot. Love that. 
Well, hey, James, we're coming up to the end of the time here. So just want to say thank you for providing all these insights. I know everything and all the little points that you've been able to mention are really valuable, especially as brands are making decisions on where to invest their time and money. And I think having that lens of what is this content going to get me and if it's going to be valuable is a really important one. And one thing that I want to stress to all the brands. So in talking about value, everyone who's attended and signed up for the event, I'll send out an email with the recap of the video after this with a 10% off uh, discount code for the hub. So definitely hop on that. Um, and then also based on those who ask questions, I'm going to do a randomized uh, generator to pick someone who has, um, will receive the free photo shoot. And then also for our Food Bevy members, we'll be offering 50% uh, off discounts for three people. It's going to be a first come first serve till January. And so keep an eye out for that if you are interested. So James, thank you so much again. Thank you everyone for joining for your great questions and hope this has been helpful and we will chat with everyone soon. Cool, and Jordan, if you could just share my email or whatever, it's just james at the hub.com, but guys, feel free to like, you know, something I love about what I do is that I'm a founder and I get to speak to so many people like you and sort of get feed off your energy all day. So for free, I'm happy to have half an hour chats with people and sort of give advice on content or any sort of marketing you're doing, looking over the shoulder of an agency you hire that you think is ripping you off, whatever. Um, so feel free to reach out, even if it's not to my direct benefit. James, one last quick question. Is there a reason why it's the, the H hub? Yeah. When I thought of the company, it was called H because we connect photographers to brands and we're the bridge in between. So we were just H and that's what everyone called us. I made 15,000 hats and, um, then we made a software platform that was the marketplace called the hub and the hub.com was taken. So we became the H hub. Not my favorite, but, uh, <laughs> but we're sticking with it. No, that'll be good. Just so everyone remembers, it's the, the hhub.com. Awesome. Yeah, well, thanks H. so much, everyone. Yeah, two H's. Yeah. Thanks so much, everyone, and talk to you all soon.